Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I had the opportunity to interview an owner that started her business out of her kitchen, which got me thinking about all the other businesses that have been created out of homes in hopes of inspiring my listeners to think big in even the smallest of spaces. By now, we have all heard of the story of Jeff Bezos, who started Amazon.com in 1995 from the garage of a home he was renting in Bellevue, Washington. Or perhaps you have seen the movie The Social Network that highlights the rise of Facebook and their CEO Mark Zuckerberg in the dorm rooms. Now, there are many opportunities, and I want to take this time to highlight a few that I have found interesting that can be done from home. This is just a small list and certainly not an all-inclusive list of every job that can be done at home, but I hope they spark some innovative juices. First, craft businesses. That's right. Let's get back to making things. When I started my clothing line, SLM Apparel, I considered it more of a craft business than a clothing line, as most of my sales came from running booths at Saturday markets or from my friends and family supporting the business. I would hand draw my art, print it on a computer, screen print it in my garage, and then off to market. Today, many craft businesses use trade shows for craft trade or websites like Etsy. Another option, start a blog. And in truth, this is something I may need to do as well. Some of you may have heard of the name The Huffington Post. After a failed race for the governorship of California in 2003, Ariana Huffington started the blog with a friend. They filled their blog with aggregating news and stories and providing political commentary. Named the Huffington Post, the blog was widely successful. Eight years later, they sold it for $350 million. Not too bad for a blog. Another fun idea? Home bakery. In fact, I have a family member that is currently in the home baking industry. Although they do not bake, but still create authentic Mexican candy and they have aspirations of making a food cart one day. Depending on the type of food that you are in or making, you may be able to sell it through local food stores, through restaurants, or even through customers online using delivery services such as UPS. There are so many other businesses that can be started from home, like working at Avon or cutting the neighbor's lawn, just how I started my entrepreneurship life at the age of eight. Who knows? Maybe if I stuck with it, I could have turned it into a landscaping business. When you begin to look at life through the lens that every passion, every idea, and every problem is an opportunity to create a business, it is amazing what you can create. But don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. created a better brand inspiring people to make their own choices starting with a drink she is passionate about bringing inclusivity to the mystery of cocktails and an advocate from the not everyday drinker please welcome the co-founder and chief marketing officer of the bitter housewife genevieve brazelton hello everyone and welcome to the shades of entrepreneurship this is your host mr gabriel flores i am here today with the owner of bitter housewife genevieve brazelton 
Very excited to talk about this bitters because I like to drink bitters. <laughs> Genevieve, first, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Of course. Would love to kind of get a little background, a little bio, just to introduce the world to Genevieve. Oh, a bio. It's long and winding. Well, uh, I do have quite the background in food and beverage. I went to school to uh, be a writing major. Um, so, of course, you had to work in restaurants to pay your way and, and all of that. And I've but I've always loved food and drink. I've waited tables and worked behind bars and worked in kitchens and also just been kind of a, a maker, too. I like to make things at home. To see if they're better. We bake bread every week well before the nice. pandemic had people doing mm, that. So, I, yeah, it sounds so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bitters was just a project, actually, that I wanted to try out to see if it was truly any better than the Angostura that I was used to using in the bar. And it turns out that, yes, it is <laughs> quite a bit better. I, I really didn't expect it when I made my first batch of bitters. I was like, yeah, this will be fun, interesting, learning a little bit about the ingredients. Then I'll go back and let the professionals do it. But it turns out, yeah, they not only do they taste much, much better. I really got inspired to then make what I thought were the perfect bitters for an old fashioned, my favorite drink, uh, very simple. And it was actually over old fashions after probably my seventh or eighth version of these bitters that my husband said, do you think we could make a business out of selling bitters? And I said, I have no idea, but we should call it the bitter housewife. <laughs> I love, I said, love. The yes, name. we should. <laughs> Just absolutely love this name. So that was, geez, almost 10 years ago when that little spark of an idea came. And we spent a couple of years, we were in San Francisco at the time, figuring out what licensing a bidders company looks like. Uh, turns out most government uh, branches don't also know what to do with you. Yeah. What, what does that look like? <laughs> Cause so in Oregon, well, and every state's a little bit different too, when it mm -hmm. comes to liquor, we all like to make our own rules. Um, but in Oregon, uh, we are actually a food product. We are not governed by the OLCC. So we so you're FDA. Yeah, we are FDA to follow all of those rules. And we are actually on the books still as patent medicine, which, you know, interesting kind of feels fun. So, so you're making <laughs> potions. We're making, we're making potions. Yeah. <laughs> we are true snake oil salesmen. <laughs> that is incredible. So, so let's, let's talk about how, how it kind of evolved. So you started just making them in your home. I did. Yep. And with no, you know, no intention other than this is something fun to do and I'll make some better drinks at home. But then I started playing around with flavors and it was a lot of fun. My husband, who is also quite the entrepreneur, has spent at that point all of his life doing software and had never made a physical product and was really not happy where he was and wanted to make a physical product. And so he really started pushing, like, let's see if there's something viable here. And my creative brain kicked in. I do have a bit of a marketing and publicity background, too. And I started to look at what was on the market. And it was every all the bidders there were made by ex-bartenders and most of them male. And they were all these, you know, precious little bottles with sepia toned labels and script writing and maybe even hand numbered batches and felt very exclusive. And as though you needed to be a part of the cool group to even understand how to use them and what they were for. You know, I am a very food and beverage educated person and I knew what they were talking about, but that was not appealing to me. I would never consider myself a cocktail geek. I just like good drinks. So nobody was talking to me and nobody was talking to my friends. You know, we all drank whiskey. We can appreciate a good scotch and an aged tequila. And I like a really good cocktail, but none of those were exciting. None of the brands that were out there were exciting. I saw a hole. I wanted to make something that I felt was accessible and fun and playful. You know, the name, of course, was definitely tongue in cheek yes. and playful. And so <laughs> go with that. I mean, the puns with bitter are endless. And I didn't set out to make a brand that was necessarily, you know, woman focused, 
but just much more accessible in general. So that somebody who came to bidders for the first time, not knowing what they were, but just curious about how they worked in drinks, would feel as welcome as that cocktail geek who's got 20 bidders collecting dust on his bar. And they would both appreciate the product that I made. So that was the, you know, the ultimate goal as we really started to shape the brand. Nice. For <laughs> listeners at home, you know, that might not be familiar with what a bidder is. What What is a bitter? So the simplest ex- explanation is it is an extract. We take a whole bunch of ingredients and we pull out all the goodness, all the good flavor, and it's super concentrated and a few drops go a long way. But the way that they work in cocktails is if you think of them like your spice rack, they are balancing in their blending. And I always use the analogy of tomato soup. You make a tomato soup and when you get to the end, you add a little salt and pepper and basil. Mm. The soup is not the same without the basil. The soup is not about the basil, but if it wasn't there, you would miss it. It makes the tomatoes taste a little bit sweeter and it just adds a little depth. That's exactly what bitters will do for your cocktail. You really shouldn't taste them on their own, but you should notice if they're missing. And they balance the strong of the alcohol, the sour of maybe that lemon juice or even that twist at the end, the sweet of a little um, of sugar or a little liqueur or even a juice. They bring that all together, add a little depth and that extra flavor that you just can't get. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's talk about, you know, the the origin of it. Right. Uh, you kind of mentioned the kind of background to it and why you created it as well. How did you create it? So what what are the process like? What did you have to do? to start your own business, just for the listeners at home to kind of understand. But not only that, what are you extracting? (laughs) (laughs) What am I putting into my drinks? (laughs) Yes, multi-level. So so that making of the bitters, yeah, the, the extracting. Basically, I start with that high level flavor. So the perfect example is our cardamom bitters, one of our most popular flavors. It's about cardamom. So I took cardamom and went, what are a couple other flavors, spices, herbs, whatever, that kind of highlight that flavor that go really well with it. I chose cinnamon and a spice called grains of paradise, which is a cousin of black pepper. It has kind of a bright, almost cranberry flavor up front, but it does have just a little bit of that subtle black pepper spice. So it's not as intense though. Paired those with it. And then you've got that underlying base of the bitter herbs or botanicals. Most of them are actually roots and barks. But in that case, I use gentian, uh, which is uh, the root of an alpine flower. It has a really earthy, bitter flavor. And then I also use a little bit of quassia, which is the um, stem of a shrub that you can find mostly in South America. And it is really, really bitter, but just this clean bitter, like you kind of can't taste anything else. And then there is a little bit of black walnut leaf also, which is much softer. It's bitter, but not real powerful. But it has um, almost a sweet kind of vanilla flavor to it, too. Not it doesn't really taste like walnut at all, but it, it just adds a little roundness. So it is like any recipe. I'm putting all these ingredients together to kind of fill in the holes of flavor, you know, make sure there's something that gives it a little roundness, make sure something gives it a little sharpness. And, and yeah. so all those that you mentioned, does that all go into one bottle of bitter? Yes. Oh, well, the, and that's the cardamom is actually one of our simplest recipes. <laughs> the aromatic bitters, I be, if I remember correctly, has 17 different ingredients in wow. it. And the simple ones like the grapefruit and the cardamom have like five or six. But that, yeah, all of it goes together. Yeah. Um, we extract all of the ingredients together. That's another thing. Some, some of the bitters that are made, people will extract each of the ingredients separately and then blend those extractions for the final product. I really believe that that throwing them all together, there's an extra level of alchemy that you just can't make happen on your own, that they do kind of balance themselves out. You know, whether that's scientifically true or not, I have no idea, but I'm sticking (laughs) with that. (laughs) So for the listeners at home, because, you know, what I like to do is I like to try to educate, right? Essentially focus on the entrepreneur and like how they built their business. Yeah. So in that regard, how did you scale this? So like, how did you take it from an idea and you finally created this mixture in your kitchen to scaling it mass production now being sold globally. Yeah. Well, we're still working on the global part. I know. I was trying to to build you up there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, 
<laughs> We're gonna get there. <laughs> Trial and error, honestly. Um, well, and and it, and it is interesting because I think you start with an idea and you have to just try something and see if it works. We figured cocktail bitters. Okay, we're going to sell to bars and restaurants. Seems pretty logical. So we started reaching out to bars and restaurants and sending out samples and doing some pounding the pavement. And it just so happened that we had a really good friend who worked at New Seasons Market here in Portland. And she loved what we had created. And she put a bottle on the desk of the guy who does the local finds program there. And he loved it. He thought it was awesome. That actually ended up being our first wholesale customer. Oh, okay. Was New Seasons. And we're like, grocery? I don't know. Maybe, you know, it doesn't seem like that would be where it's going to move the most, but you go with what's in front of you. And they did start moving the product. They supported the product. And we also, we launched actually in October of 2014. So right pre-holiday. And I am also very comfortable with craft fairs and gift fairs and that kind of thing. So we went to one on a whim just to see would people actually buy bitters for us from us directly? You know, is there enough of a market? And I think we, you know, we showed up with like four cases of bitters having no idea. We ended up going home twice that first oh, wow. day to restock. My, you know, I stayed there and my husband went home and was actually labeling bottles on our kitchen table to bring back to me so that we didn't sell out. Wow. So that also kind of then it steered us in a different direction. It's like, okay, People want to give these as gifts. People are curious about having these for themselves. So that seemed the path of least resistance to then focus on grocery, specialty retail, you know, small gift shops, specialty food stores, and we sold online. But I think, you know, there's a lot of things that wasn't necessarily the thing that we started out with, but there was also looking at the environment too. We realized Oregon, because it's a control state, even the bars and restaurants that were interested and did use us, they weren't often buying directly from us. They were buying from the liquor stores because that was the easiest right, thing yeah. for them. That's where, yeah. And, and so we didn't know. We actually didn't know how many were using our stuff. And, and the fickle nature of bars too is they like to put something new on the menu and use it for a while. And then the next new thing goes on the menu Mm, instead. So, or the bar manager who really loves you then moves somewhere else and you may not know where they end up. And so that was a hard, you know, I mean, when you're two people doing everything to then manage all of those relationships that just proved harder than we were quite right, you know, than we were able to really manage. So, you know, I think you brought up a great educational opportunity in regards to the grassroots efforts in which you grew. How important was that, you know, in your beginning stages? Cause it sounds like you, you and your husband were kind of doing it, you know, mass producing and distributors and labelers by yourself at the <laughs> beginning. Right? Oh, we did. We still, I mean, we still label on occasion and, you know, we're a whole crazy team of five people I and love it. now and not, you know, feels big some days. But yeah, in the beginning, I mean, we made it in some of it was made in our basement and some of it was made in the back prep room of a local restaurant. And we bottled it on our kitchen table and we labeled it on our kitchen table and we drove around and, you know, made all the deliveries for the first year. My my husband was working in Intel at the time and he would like make deliveries on his lunch hour, you know, and on his (laughs) way home. So he'd load it up in the morning and you do what you have to do. Yeah, you do. And that's that's such an incredible story too because I think, you know, what it highlights is starting grassroots is okay, right? Not everybody starts on the, uh, you know, $100 million um, brand deal, right? And, and so starting small is nice. It is and it's a different way to do business, but I also think that it's absolutely invaluable too, just to understand all the pieces. I mean, when we, so our, our newer focus is bitters and soda, which is our canned ready to drink bitters and soda. It's a zero alcohol, zero sugar beverage and general, you know, process in the beverage world would have been to take the flavor that we wanted, send it to a lab, have them figure out how to make it with natural flavorings, even if you if you wanted to go natural, if you didn't care, just 
flavorings and then ship that to a co-packer, that recipe that the lab developed to a co-packer who then makes a few hundred thousand cases of it. And then all you do is sell it. You may never even touch that product. Yeah. And we said, no, that is not what we do. We made the first batch at Aria Gin in there still. And then we shipped totes of that concentrate base over across the river to a canner in Stevens, Washington, because you do need a, you know, you do need somebody who's got a canning line if you're going to do more than a few cases at a time. But we only did a thousand cases the first run. That first thousand cases, we did deliver at least half of those ourselves. Oh, my goodness. You know, Um, we did finally the last few pallets. We we did get a distributor on board that we shipped them off to. But, you know. It was, uh, it's still very much a hands-on business. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about, let's talk about the difficulties a little bit. <clears throat> so <laughs> yes, let's, let's, uh, let's chat about the fun stuff. You're still growing. You're still building oh, the business, yes. right? Yes. Um, what would you say is some of the difficult parts that you've ran into? Oh, there's so many every day. I mean, I think generally what everything that is a struggle for us boils down to really two things, cash flow or lack of experience or knowledge, you know? And honestly, cash flow is probably the hardest part of it. When you're small and you don't have a war chest, you hold off making some decisions because you're not quite sure if that, you know, buying six months of that thing is really worth it for the savings that you get. So you pay more for things. You don't have the scale. It just doesn't give you, you know, you don't have that flexibility. But you figure out how to make it work and you learn a lot of things on on the way. And we, you know, we have never we have never run a beverage business before this. So there are always things. Uh, today was a perfect example. I am making some test batches of a new flavor of the bitters and soda. We've actually never really made batches this small before. I usually mix like the base with just already carbonated soda water for my tasting purposes. And then we make a bigger couple hundred gallon batch to go to market. So I wanted to do some taste tests with some folks and I made a couple five gallon batches. I don't know anything about carbonation, really. It's all foamy and flat. I don't know why. (laughs) Go to Google. (laughs) That's the best place to go. If you don't know, (laughs) go go to Google. Go to Google and then you find some forums about, you know, home beer makers and soda makers and carbonation. And you go, oh, our fridge isn't cold enough. (laughs) Even though the thermostat says that it's this temperature, it probably isn't. Let's get an outside thermostat in there. Oh, yeah, it's not even close. Oh, my goodness. (gasps) Okay. And I mean, that's like a daily thing. So I think that you know, being able to to roll with that and just go, all right, we're going to figure this out. And we'll, you know, it's one more thing that we now know. You mentioned you're doing some taste testing. Is is Do you kind of do taste testing often? And have you done it with all of your products? To some extent, I have done it with all of the products. I do all the flavor development. So it's a spark of an idea in my brain. And I have my little R&D section in the kitchen that's, you know, a lot of mason jars with strange colored liquids in them. And, um, so you really are making potions, right? I really am making potions. Yeah. You know, and lots of bags of weird dried things. <laughs> but, you know, I start with an idea and I do some tests and do some recipes. And when I get to something that I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Then I at least enlist a few other people to taste it. And what do you think? You know, am I on the right track or taste these two things? Which one do you like better? And tell me why. You know, am I going in the right direction? As we grow, we've got a little bit more space in our development process and we're just getting better at it. Um, Still need to level it up, but we are getting better. It's fun just to bring people in to get feedback because you um, you never know what they're going to say. In terms of they may have an idea that, you know, oh, this this would be really awesome if you did that. I was like, I never thought of that. You're right. That would be. And and now your product is 10 times better. I am supremely proud of everything that we've put out. But I always think, you know, outside opinions are extremely valid. Definitely. Definitely. So where, where, where are you guys headed? What does the next 10 years look like for the Bitter Housewife? We're 
really, I mean, I think the our main focus is this is the bitters and soda. That is the really scalable part of the business. Bitters will always be a niche product. And while we can still make a, a very decent business out of it, it doesn't have the growth potential. But it's fun and it gives us some validity and I like making flavors. So it's not going anywhere. But the bitters and soda, we really want to develop much more of a D to C program that has different subscription options. Flesh out that line. Right now we have two flavors, third one's on the way, hopefully another one this year, maybe even two this year. And then we need to expand out of the Northwest too. Right now the bitters and soda is only distributed in Oregon and Washington. And we do have a handful of stores that carry it across the country, but need to start looking at new regions. Chicago is really appealing. We've got a lot of customers there already. So that shows that there's a need. There's something about Philadelphia, too. We send a lot of packages to Philadelphia. So I think just paying attention and start opening up a few new regions. Ten years from now, I think, you know, if if we have our druthers, maybe maybe we're at the point where we're thinking about retirement. That's what I'm talking about. You know, and either this is a big enough brand that and it's still our company, but we are more like, you know, board directors that come in every once in a while or or we sell it. You know, I also we have never, never had the idea that we wouldn't try to sell this business, build it into something to then sell. I love it. It is my baby. I would I will have some regrets in seeing someone else take it over or not regrets, loss in seeing someone else take it over. But, you know, on to the next thing. Yeah. And and I knew that was a part of it from the beginning. So looking back on everything, <clears throat> you know, all of your experiences that you've had, what advice would you give yourself? Would you change anything? Yes, I would. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we've done that I wish I could go back and do differently. But I would still say that we learned from every single one of them. Biggest thing I think that we didn't do in the beginning that I would have loved to have been told or probably was told really, really (laughs) embraced was to really, really understand your customer and why they're buying your product. Yeah. What problem are you solving for them? Don't assume that, you know, and constantly ask it. You get the same answer over and over again. Chances are a year or two down the road, it's going to change. Your customers are going to change. And we are really learning that now with the bitters and soda. And we're learning it all over again. You are not your customer. You never are your customer. Even if you're really, really close, you're not because you're the one making it. You're not the one buying. Right, right. (laughs) So for those individuals that are at home that are interested in bitters... Where can they find you? Where can they purchase the Bitter Housewife? Well, uh, if you are in the Portland area, you can find all of our products at uh, Market of Choice and New Seasons Markets, all of those. Hollywood Beverage also carries pretty much everything that we make. In the Seattle area, PCC carries a lot of what we do, a lot of our flavors, both the bitters and soda and the bitters. Um, You can find actually our bitters at all the Safeways in the Seattle area. Oh, wow. Wow. Oddly enough, not Safeway here, but you know, <laughs> that's part of small business <laughs> and we'll get, state lines. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. And you can always buy from us direct too. And we have a pretty decent uh, store finder. If you're not in the Pacific Northwest, we do have a lot of small retailers across the country or, you know, we ship everywhere. And how do they find you online? Thebitterhousewife.com. Perfect. You got yeah. social media? We do. We're uh, Instagram and Facebook, The Bitter Housewife. Make it easy. Uh, We have a semi-active Twitter that is just Bitter Housewife. We couldn't get the duh. (laughs) Somebody else owned that already. Man. (laughs) Genevieve Bravelton, the founder of The Bitter Housewife. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.